As dusk settled over the secluded Japanese village of Mizugumo, shadows grew long and the air became thick with the ancient whispers of folklore. Hiroshi, a weary traveler, had been wandering through the forested mountain path for hours. His feet ached, his throat was parched, and the encroaching darkness began to play tricks on his eyes. Just when he was about to give up hope, he stumbled upon an ethereal sight, a tea house that looked like something from a dream, concealed behind the veil of cherry blossoms and ancient pines. Pushing the wooden door open, Hiroshi was greeted by the smell of fresh tea leaves and a soothing melody from a koto. And then he saw her, Yumi, dressed in a beautiful kimono. Her eyes sparkled like moonlight on a river's surface. Welcome, traveler, she greeted, her voice as melodious as the koto that still echoed in the room. You look weary. Come, rest your feet, and let me serve you some tea. Entranced by Yumi's beauty and the promise of comfort, Hiroshi accepted the offer. He knew not what spell he was under, but at that moment, he couldn't have cared less. For the first time in days, Hiroshi felt at peace, blissfully ignorant of the intricate web he had just stepped into. Hiroshi settled into a plush cushion, still mesmerized by the serenity of the tea house and its enchanting hostess. Yumi gracefully poured him a cup of green tea from a delicate iron teapot. The steam rose, intertwining with her fingers as if dancing to an inaudible tune. Are you traveling alone? Yumi asked, her eyes meeting Hiroshi's. Yes, I find solace in solitude, Hiroshi replied, taking a sip of his tea. The warmth spread through him like a comforting embrace. Ah, a wandering soul. Well, you're welcome to spend the night here. I have a room prepared if you wish. Thank you, Yumi. Your kindness is as beautiful as this place, Hiroshi said, feeling a sense of ease wash over him. Unbeknownst to Hiroshi, Yumi's eyes flickered for just a moment, glowing an unnatural shade of yellow. As he took another sip of his tea, Yumi discreetly pulled a silk thread from her kimono, weaving it into the tatami mat beneath them. Your room is ready, Yumi announced, leading Hiroshi down a dimly lit corridor. Each door they passed seemed identical, yet Hiroshi felt a chill as they approached the room meant for him. The door slid open, revealing a simple but cozy space. A futon was neatly laid out, and a soft light emanated from a paper lantern. Sleep well, Yumi said, her lips curling into a knowing smile as she closed the door. Hiroshi lay down, still enchanted by Yumi and the peaceful atmosphere of the tea house. What he didn't notice was the faint glimmer of silk threads crisscrossing above him, woven into the ceiling like a barely visible spider's web. As Hiroshi drifted into sleep, Yumi returned to the main hall, her form shifting ever so subtly. Legs extended from her torso, her eyes mutated into multiple lenses, and her mouth morphed into a grotesque fanged maw. She took a moment to relish her true form, then swiftly returned to her human disguise. Sweet dreams, Hiroshi, she whispered to herself, spinning more silk in the dark corners of the tea house. You'll need them. Hiroshi found himself in the clutches of unsettling dreams. Visions of cobwebs engulfed him, and shadows danced in the peripheries of his mind. A whisper, a murmur almost too quiet to be heard, rippled through the darkness. Startled, he woke up in a cold sweat. He glanced around the room, trying to adjust his eyes to the dim light filtering through the paper walls. Everything seemed in order, and yet an inexplicable feeling of dread hung heavy in the air. He dismissed it as a byproduct of his vivid nightmares. A faint rustling sound broke the stillness, coming from beyond the walls of his room. Hiroshi strained his ears. Was it the sound of silk being spun? The thought crept into his mind, uninvited, setting his heart pounding. Shaking off his apprehensions, Hiroshi convinced himself he was being irrational. Perhaps it was just Yumi preparing the tea house for the next day. He took a deep breath, attempting to lull himself back to sleep. In the main hall, Yumi, 
or the creature that pretended to be her, smirked. Her web had been cast, and the vibrations told her that her prey was restless. Good, she thought. Fear makes the soul all the more delicious. In a silent, sinuous motion, she crawled up to the ceiling, blending in perfectly with the shadows. Her multiple eyes glistened in the dark, watching the room where Hiroshi lay. It was not yet time to strike. The web had not yet drawn tight enough. With a sigh that sounded almost like a hiss, she returned to her human form. Yumi knew that patience was the essence of the hunt. In the depths of the night, she whispered an incantation, strengthening the silken threads around Hiroshi's room. Rest while you can, she murmured to herself, as she spun yet another layer of her deadly web. Morning light seeped through the rice paper walls of Hiroshi's room. He woke up still feeling the lingering anxiety from his nocturnal disturbances. As he sat up, he found a small, ornate box beside his futon. Curiosity getting the better of him, Hiroshi opened it to reveal an intricately crafted silk robe. A note lay beside it. For you, wear this tonight, Yumi. Despite the eerie feelings of the previous night, Hiroshi couldn't help but be captivated by the gesture. The robe felt incredibly soft to the touch, like an extension of Yumi's allure. Intrigued yet cautious, he decided to wear it that evening. Throughout the day, Yumi was particularly attentive. She flirted openly, her touches lingering a little longer, her eyes more intensely focused on Hiroshi. The atmosphere was thick with tension, both of an unsettling and an enticing nature. As evening approached, Hiroshi donned the silk robe. It fit him perfectly, almost unnaturally so. He couldn't shake the feeling that he was being enveloped, not just by the fabric, but by Yumi's increasingly magnetic presence. Ah, you look divine, Yumi cooed as she saw him, her eyes sweeping appreciatively over him. Would you care for some sake tonight? They sat close, sipping the warm liquor as their eyes locked in a dance of both suspicion and fascination. Yumi leaned in closer, whispering, I have something special to show you, but you must promise not to be scared. A chill ran down Hiroshi's spine. Despite his reservations, the intoxicating combination of sake, Yumi's beauty, and his own gnawing curiosity compelled him to agree. Yumi led him down a narrow, dimly lit corridor, different from the one that housed his room. Hiroshi couldn't help but notice the walls here were adorned with intricate designs of spiders and webs. Finally, Yumi slid open a door revealing a room unlike any Hiroshi had seen before. It was a lavish chamber, filled with beautiful tapestries and antique furniture. But most unnerving were the large ornate silk webs that stretched across one corner of the room. As Hiroshi's eyes adjusted to the dim lighting, he felt a chill crawl up his spine. Hidden in the shadows, entangled in the intricate silk webs, were lifeless bodies. They were drained of color, their features twisted in eternal horror. A nauseating realization washed over him. He was not the first man to be entranced by Yumi, and if he didn't act fast, he would meet the same gruesome end. Isn't it beautiful, Yumi said her voice dripping with both sweetness and menace. Hiroshi's instinct screamed for him to flee, yet he felt paralyzed. It was as if the room, Yumi, and the very silk robe he wore were conspiring to keep him rooted to the spot. And it was at that precise moment Hiroshi realized he was not just the guest in Yumi's tea house, he was her prey. Hiroshi's heart pounded in his chest, its rhythm echoing in his ears like a frantic drumbeat. He looked into Yumi's eyes and saw them for what they truly were. Bottomless pools of darkness, luring him deeper into her web. Yumi circled him, each step calculated, her eyes never leaving his. You know, Hiroshi, you're not like the others. You're more... perceptive, wouldn't you agree? Hiroshi, struggling to regain his composure, managed to stammer, What are you? The corners of her mouth curled into a smile that was more predatory than welcoming. Ah, the moment of clarity. 
It always comes too late. Her form began to shift, her limbs elongated, new appendages bursting forth from her torso, her face contorted, eyes multiplying until they peppered her forehead like dark jewels. Before Hiroshi stood a monstrous spider, massive and terrifying. Yumi, or the creature she really was, had revealed her true form, Yorogumo, the Binding Bride. Hiroshi felt the robe tighten around him, its threads constricting like serpents. He was bound, entrapped in a web of silk and deception. A primal fear gripped him, but alongside it emerged a surge of adrenaline. If he was going to survive, he had to act now. Summoning every ounce of strength, Hiroshi ripped off the silk robe. Threads snapped and popped as he tore it away from his body, freeing himself from its ensnaring grasp. The Jorogomo hissed, enraged. You think you can escape? No one leaves my web. Just then, Hiroshi remembered the tanto he always carried for emergencies. With a swift motion, he unsheathed it. The blade shimmered in the dim light of the room. It was a desperate move, but it was all he had. As the creature lunged at him, Hiroshi slashed forward, cutting through several of her front legs. A screech echoed through the room, deafening and otherworldly. Wounded but not defeated, the Jorogumo recoiled, giving Hiroshi the briefest window to dart out of the room. His heart felt like it was going to burst from his chest, but he didn't dare to stop, not until he was far, far away from the accursed tea house. The Jorogumo watched him go, nursing her injuries. You may have escaped, Hiroshi, but my web stretches farther than you can run. As Hiroshi emerged into the night, gasping for air, he knew this was far from over. But for now, at least, he was alive. Hiroshi had been running for what seemed like an eternity when he finally stumbled into a small, desolate village. Though he had managed to put distance between himself and the horror he had encountered, the feeling of being watched still prickled the back of his neck. He sought refuge in a modest inn, his appearance drawing concerned looks from the few locals gathered in the common room. The innkeeper, an elderly man with kind but weary eyes, offered him a room with a sympathetic nod, no questions asked. In the solace of his new temporary quarters, Hiroshi pondered his next steps. He couldn't go back. That much was clear. But could he truly escape the web that had been spun around him? His mind raced as he weighed his options. Meanwhile, back at the tea house, the Jorogumo had already begun her plan for revenge. Hiroshi had wounded her, both physically and in her pride, and such offenses could not go unanswered. She knew he would be cautious now, so she would have to be cunning. As night fell, Hiroshi couldn't shake off the dread that settled over him. Each creak of the floorboards, every rustling of the wind against the window, sent shivers down his spine. He knew he was not yet free. Without warning, the room plunged into darkness. The single lantern flickered out as if snuffed by an unseen hand. Hiroshi felt his pulse quicken. This was no mere accident. He took out his tanto again, holding it firmly as he strained his eyes to adjust to the darkness. Just then, he heard it. A soft, skittering sound too deliberate to be a mere animal. The Jorogumo had found him. But Hiroshi was ready. With a sudden movement, he slashed through the darkness, his blade connecting with something solid. A strangled hiss filled the room. The lantern flared back to life, as if compelled by the room's sudden change of atmosphere. In the dim light, Hiroshi saw it, a severed spider's leg twitching on the floor. He had wounded the creature again, forcing it to retreat into the shadows. But as Hiroshi caught his breath, his gaze fell upon the window. Etched into the frost were the words, You cannot escape. Despite his small victory, Hiroshi felt no sense of triumph, only the weight of a lingering dread. He knew he had merely postponed the inevitable. The Jorogumo was still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for another chance to ensnare him. Having severed one of the Jorogumo's legs, Hiroshi didn't pause to celebrate his small victory. He bolted from the inn, his breath ragged, his pulse a chaotic symphony in his ears. He knew that wounding the creature wouldn't be enough to stop her, 
He needed to put as much distance between himself and that accursed place as possible. After running for what felt like hours through the dense forest, Hiroshi finally collapsed from exhaustion, convinced that he had escaped, for now. As the dawn's first light began to break, a sobering thought crossed his mind. He could never return to his old life. The web spun around him was invisible but unbreakable, its threads woven from strands of fear, distrust, and ever-present danger. He eventually found his way to a neighboring village, where he adopted a new identity and tried to start anew. But Hiroshi was a changed man, haunted by an experience that defied understanding. He avoided making connections, for fear that the Jorogumo's web might ensnare anyone who got too close to him. Then one day, as he was passing through yet another village, he saw it. A quaint tea house, its lanterns glowing invitingly in the gathering dusk. An eerie sense of deja vu washed over him. Despite every instinct screaming at him to keep walking, he found himself drawn to the entrance, as if pulled by an invisible thread. As he stood there, his hand hovering indecisively over the door handle, a shiver ran down his spine. He realized with a chilling clarity that his story was far from over. In the depths of winter, under the veil of night, a group of friends, driven by curiosity and the thrill of legend, made their way to a remote village nestled at the foot of the mountains. The village, a cluster of dimly lit homes and narrow, snow-covered streets, seemed almost suspended in time, untouched by the outside world. The group, Haruto, a skeptic, Aiko, the adventurous spirit, Kenji, the historian, and Yumi, who harbored a deep fascination with the supernatural, had heard tales of the Yukiona, the snow woman who was said to haunt these parts. Their arrival was met with wary eyes and hushed tones from the villagers, who spoke of the Yukiana not as a myth, but a grim reality. She walks the forests on nights like these, an old shopkeeper whispered, his voice barely rising above the crackle of the fire. Beautiful as the moonlit snow, cold as the deepest winter, those who seek her seldom return. Ignoring the warnings, the friends set up camp at the edge of the forest, where the trees stood like silent sentinels in the snow. The air was bitingly cold, the silence of the night punctuated only by the distant howl of the wind. This is it, Yumi breathed, her eyes alight with excitement and fear. Tonight, we uncover the truth. As night deepened, they ventured into the forest, guided by the light of their torches and the thrill of the unknown. The snow crunched under their feet, the forest around them a labyrinth of shadows and whispering winds. It wasn't long before they realized they were not alone. A figure appeared in the distance, ethereal, almost glowing in the dim light of the moon. Her beauty was otherworldly, her presence chilling. Haruto's breath caught in his throat, and Aiko's hand flew to her mouth in disbelief. Kenji stumbled backward, his previous bravado evaporating into the cold night air. Yumi, however, stepped forward, her voice barely a whisper. Yuki Ona? The snow woman's eyes met Yumi's, a gaze as penetrating as the cold. Then, without a word, she turned, her form blending into the snowstorm that began to swirl around them. The friends, now seized by a fear they had never known, found themselves drawn deeper into the forest, as if led by an unseen force. The night wore on, the storm intensifying with each step they took. The path back to the village, once clear in their minds, became a distant memory, obscured by the blinding snow and the ice that seemed to seep into their bones. As the cold numbed their senses, a realization dawned on them. The Yuki Ana was not just a tale to frighten children. She was real, and she had led them into her domain, a realm from which there seemed no escape. The laughter and skepticism that had warmed them at the start of their journey were now gone, replaced by a terror that clung to them as closely as the cold. Haruto, his voice barely audible over the howl of the wind, turned to his friends. 
We need to find shelter, he said, the urgency in his tone mirroring the fear in his eyes. Before it's too late. But as they huddled together, moving as one against the storm, a silent figure watched from the shadows, her eyes reflecting the moonlight, her intentions as inscrutable as the winter night. The storm grew fiercer, a white fury that consumed everything in its path, erasing the line between earth and sky. The friends, led by Haruto's desperate determination, stumbled through the blizzard, their eyes barely open against the onslaught of snow and wind. Each step forward was a battle, the cold an enemy that sought to claim them, limb by limb. As they pressed on, a shape emerged from the tempest, a dilapidated hut, its appearance as sudden as it was welcome. With the last of their strength, they made their way inside, the door creaking shut behind them, cutting off the howl of the wind. The interior was dark, save for the faint glow of moonlight filtering through the cracks in the walls. It was empty, abandoned, or so it seemed. A refuge, albeit a meager one, from the relentless cold. They huddled together, their breaths creating clouds in the air, their bodies shivering uncontrollably. Kenji, his teeth chattering, managed to light a small fire with the matches they had brought. The flame, though feeble, was a beacon of hope, casting shadows that danced along the walls. It was Yumi who broke the silence. She's playing with us, she said, her voice a mix of fear and fascination. The Yuki Ona, she lured us here. Aiko wrapped her arms around herself, trying to absorb the warmth from the fire. But why? What does she want from us? The legends, Kenji murmured, his eyes fixed on the flames. They say she preys on those who disrespect her domain, on those who dare to challenge the winter. Haruto's gaze hardened. Then we were fools to come here, but we're not going to lie down and die. We need to find a way out, to get back to the village. Their resolve, however, was soon tested. As the night deepened, the temperature inside the hut plummeted, the fire reduced to embers. They could hear it then, the soft, haunting melody of a woman's voice, carried by the wind. It was beautiful, mesmerizing, and with it came a cold so intense, it seemed to freeze their very souls. They peered through the cracks in the hut, and there she was, the Yuki Ana, her figure illuminated by the moonlight, her eyes locked on theirs. There was a sadness in her gaze, a loneliness that spoke of centuries spent in the cold embrace of winter. But there was also a hunger there, a desire that sent shivers down their spines. They were left to ponder their fate, to wonder if mercy was a gift she would grant, or a cruel trick before a more sinister end. The night was far from over, and the true horror of their situation was only beginning to unfold. In the suffocating silence of the hut, as the embers of their hope flickered and died, the group's fleeting sense of safety shattered. The storm outside did not relent, but instead seemed to grow more furious, as if enraged by their attempts to survive. The cold crept through the cracks, an uninvited predator stalking its prey. It was Aiko who first sensed the shift, a subtle change in the air that made her skin crawl. She's here, she whispered, terror lacing her words. They turned in unison towards the door, watching as frost began to spread across the wooden surface, creeping along the edges like icy fingers. Without warning, the door burst open, a violent gust of wind extinguishing their last source of light. In the darkness, they heard the sound of footsteps, deliberate and slow, a harbinger of doom approaching. The Yuki Ana stood in the threshold, her beauty a stark contrast to the malevolence that radiated from her. You have trespassed in my domain, she hissed, her voice a cold wind that seemed to cut through them. For that, you shall pay. Before they could react, she moved among them, a blur of white. Her touch was death her fingers leaving trails of frostbite on exposed skin. Kenji screamed as her hand passed through his chest, his body freezing from the inside out, his eyes wide with terror before they became glassy and still. 
The horror of Kenji's death spurred them into frantic action. Haruto and Yumi tried to barricade the door, while Aiko searched desperately for anything to use as a weapon. But the Yuki Ana was relentless, her laughter a chilling echo in the cramped space. She turned her attention to Yumi, who stood frozen in fear. With a cruel smile, the Yuki Ana whispered, Your warmth will be mine. Before exhaling a breath so cold, it seemed to solidify the air itself. Yumi's cries were cut short as she was encased in ice, a perfect, horrifying statue of terror. Haruto and Aiko, the only ones left, realized the futility of their resistance. In a last act of desperation, Haruto lunged at the Yuki Ana with a piece of broken wood, his movements driven by fear and rage. But she merely smiled, dissipating into a cloud of snow, only to reappear behind him. Her hands closed around his head, a gentle caress before she twisted sharply, his neck snapping with a sound that echoed like a gunshot in the silence. Aiko fell to her knees, sobbing, surrounded by the bodies of her friends, her heart pounding with the terror of knowing she was next. The Yuki Ana approached, her gaze cold and unyielding. Your fear is exquisite, she murmured, savoring the moment. Aiko looked up, her eyes meeting the Yuki Ana's, a silent plea for mercy that she knew would not be granted. With a swift motion, the Yuki Ana drove her hand into Aiko's chest, her fingers icy daggers that pierced her heart. Aiko's scream was a burst of vapor in the cold air, her life extinguished in a moment of excruciating pain. The Yuki Ana stood alone in the hut, surrounded by the frozen, lifeless bodies of her victims. Outside, the storm began to calm, the fury abating as the snow settled on the silent forest. She vanished into the night, leaving behind a scene of horror, a testament to the folly of those who dared to intrude upon her domain. The dawn broke over a landscape transformed, the snow a pristine blanket that concealed the nightmares beneath. The village stirred, unaware of the tragedy that had unfolded in the heart of the forest. When the friends did not return, a search party was organized. They found the hut by midday, the door ajar, revealing the horror within. The villagers recoiled at the sight, the air filled with the sounds of grief and disbelief. The bodies of Haruto, Kenji, Yumi, and Aiko were found exactly as the Yuki Ana had left them, frozen statues of terror, their final moments etched in ice. The brutality of their death sent a wave of fear through the village, a chilling reminder of the power and wrath of the Yuki Ana. No one ventured into the forest again. The legend of the Yuki Ana grew. A tale of death and retribution whispered in hushed tones around flickering fires. The villagers erected a shrine at the edge of the forest, a place of mourning and respect, offering prayers and apologies to appease the spirit of the Yuki Ona and to beg for her mercy. The tragedy of the four friends became a somber legend, a cautionary tale of the dangers that lurk within the beauty of the snow-covered landscape. It served as a grim reminder of the ancient forces that command nature, indifferent to human suffering, and the folly of underestimating the power of the supernatural. As the seasons changed, the snow melted, revealing the forest once more. But the memory of that night remained, a shadow that lingered even in the warmth of summer. The villagers spoke of the Yuki Ana with a new level of reverence and fear their voices dropping to whispers when they recounted the story of the outsiders who had sought to challenge the winter and paid with their lives. The hut was left untouched, a silent monument to the horror that had occurred within its walls. Some claimed that on cold, stormy nights, they could hear the echoes of screams carried on the wind, a haunting reminder of the Yuki Ana's wrath. Years passed, and the story of the Yuki Ana and the fate of the friends was told and retold, each iteration adding to the legend, a layer of myth enveloping the truth. But for those who had seen the aftermath, who had gazed upon the frozen faces of the victims, the horror was all too real. They knew that beyond the beauty of the snow and the silence of the forest lay darkness and death, waiting for those foolish enough to venture into the domain of the Yuki Ana. And so, the forest remained a place of fear, 
a boundary between the known and the unknown, where the spirits of the lost wandered, trapped in eternal winter, their whispers a cold breeze that reminded all of the price of curiosity and the unfathomable cruelty of the Yuki Ona, guardian of the snow. In the shadowed embrace of ancient Japan, where the veil between the worlds of the living and the dead was as delicate as silk, there existed a tale so chilling it curdled the very blood of those who heard it whispered in the night. This is the story of a beauty so profound and a vengeance so deep, it transcended the boundaries of life and death. The tale of Kuchisake Onna, the slit-mouthed woman. The tale began with a woman wronged by her husband, a samurai who in a fit of jealousy and rage mutilated her face, leaving her with a grotesque ear-to-ear -ear grin. As the life bled out of her, so too did her humanity, replaced by a vengeful spirit that could not be contained by death's embrace. The villagers, aware of their own complicity and silence, feared her return, for it was said that she would seek retribution not just upon the guilty, but upon all who dared to gaze upon her. On a night when the moon hid away, ashamed to witness the earth's sorrow, a chilling wind whispered through the village. It carried a scent of impending doom, weaving through the narrow pathways and into the homes of all who lived there. A young man named Eiji, skeptical of the old tales and emboldened by the recklessness of youth, mocked the fear that gripped the heart of the village. A ghost seeking vengeance a tale for children to make them behave, he boasted in the dim light of the tavern, his voice a beacon of defiance in the shadowed gloom. Yet as he made his way home, the air thickened around him, and the mist seemed to whisper his name. A figure appeared, graceful yet imposing, her kimono fluttering silently in the non-existent breeze. A mask, beautiful and haunting, covered her face and her voice, soft yet penetrating, broke the silence. Am I beautiful? She asked, tilting her head, the mask hiding her true horror. Eiji's heart raced, the tales he had mocked now a terrifying reality before him. Yes, he stammered, his voice barely a whisper, hoping to appease the spirit. With a slow, deliberate movement, she removed her mask, revealing the grotesque smile that had been carved into her face. How about now? She whispered, her voice a death knell in the silent night. Frozen in fear, Eiji could not respond, his eyes locked on the horrifying sight before him. With a swift motion, she drew closer, her presence suffocating, as the mist seemed to close in around them, obscuring the world from view. The last thing Eiji saw was the glint of a sharp blade and the last thing he felt was the cold touch of death. As the dawn broke, the village awoke to a silence more profound than the night. Eiji's disappearance would not be the last, and the whispers of Kuchisake Ona's curse grew louder. The village, once a place of peace, had become a realm of fear, where every shadow held a threat, and every question a potential death sentence. The terror had only just begun, and the mist, ever present, seemed to hold its breath, waiting for night to fall once more. The village, shrouded in an ever-thickening mist, began to suffocate under the weight of its own dread. The disappearance of Eiji had sown seeds of panic, and the villagers whispered his fate, connecting it to the cursed legend of Kuchisake Onna. It was a cautionary tale that had morphed into a nightmarish reality, forcing them to confront the sins of their ancestors. Amidst the growing fear, a figure of skepticism and reason emerged, an elder named Kazuo. He had lived long enough to witness the cycles of fear that ebbed and flowed like the tides, yet this time he sensed something different, something far more sinister. Kazuo decided to delve into the archives of the village, seeking answers hidden in the annals of their history. What he found was a story not of a monster, but of a woman scorned. A tale of love turned to betrayal, and jealousy manifesting as cruelty. Armed with knowledge, 
Kazuo attempted to rally the villagers, advocating for a ceremony of appeasement. We must acknowledge the pain inflicted upon her, offer our regrets, and seek forgiveness, he declared in the town square, his voice carrying the weight of desperation. But the village was split, torn between fear and skepticism, and as they debated, night fell once more, bringing with it a silence that was almost tangible. Miyako, a young woman with a spirit as fierce as her beauty, found herself drawn to the outskirts of the village, compelled by a mixture of fear and curiosity. She had heard the tales, felt the chill of the wind that whispered warnings, yet something within her yearned to understand, to see beyond the veil of fear that blinded her people. As she wandered closer to the forest that bordered the village, the air grew colder and the mist thicker until she could barely see the path ahead. It was then that she heard it, a voice, soft and sorrowful, asking, Am I beautiful? Miyako froze, her heart pounding in her chest. Through the dense mist, a figure approached, her kimono gliding over the ground. It was her, Kuchisake Ona, the terror of the night. With every ounce of courage, Miyako responded, Yes, you are beautiful. Her voice steady, though her body trembled. The figure paused, then slowly removed her mask, revealing the grotesque smile that had become the stuff of nightmares. How about now? She whispered, her voice echoing the deepest fears of the human soul. Miyako, standing her ground, met the gaze of the tormented spirit before her. Your beauty is not defined by the cruelty of others, she said, her voice imbued with an empathy that transcended her fear. For a moment, the night held its breath, the mist paused in its swirling dance, and the spirit of Kuchisake Ona seemed to falter, her eyes revealing a glimmer of the human she once was. But the moment passed, and the horror that had consumed her soul reasserted itself. With a scream that pierced the night, she lunged at Miyako, her blade catching the moonlight as it descended. The village found Miyako at the edge of the forest come morning, her body a testament to the spirit's wrath. The message was clear. There was no appeasing the hate that had festered for centuries. The curse of Kuchisake Ona was a wound too deep to heal with words or ceremonies. Kazuo and the villagers mourned Miyako, her bravery a flicker of light in the overwhelming darkness. Yet, her death only served to deepen the shadows that clung to their hearts, a constant reminder of the vengeful spirit that walked among them, a specter of their collective guilt and fear. The village had become a prison of their own making, each night a trial, and every whisper of the wind a harbinger of death. The legend of Kuchisake Ona, once a story to scare children, had become their reality, a curse from which there was no escape. As the village succumbed to a pall of despair, the fabric of their community began to fray. The fear of Kuchisake Ona had seeped into every home, turning neighbor against neighbor and suspicion into paranoia. The nights grew longer and the days, though bright, could not dispel the darkness that lingered in the hearts of the people. In this atmosphere of heightened fear, a plan was hatched, born of desperation and the primal urge for survival. A group of the village's strongest men, led by a hardened warrior named Takeshi, decided to confront the specter head-on. We can no longer cower in the shadows of our ancestors' sins. It is time to end this curse with steel and blood, Takeshi proclaimed, his resolve masking the tremor of fear that underlay his words. Armed with ancient talismans and blades blessed by the village priest, they ventured into the night, a band of hunters seeking a ghost. The mist welcomed them, enveloping them in its cold embrace as they made their way toward the forest, the last known location of Kuchisake Ona's wrath. As they penetrated deeper into the forest, the air grew thick and a sense of being watched crawled over their skin. A sudden chill descended and with it, a voice barely more than a whisper, yet chillingly clear. Am I beautiful? The men halted, their bravado faltering in the face of the unseen horror. 
From the mist she emerged, her mask gleaming like a beacon of death, her presence an unspoken challenge. Takeshi, stepping forward, met her gaze, his blade ready. Your reign of terror ends tonight, spirit, he declared, his voice betraying none of his fear. Kuchisake Ona, unmoved by his defiance, removed her mask, revealing her disfigured smile. How about now? she asked, her voice a melody of death that promised a fate worse than any blade could deliver. Without hesitation, Takeshi charged, his blade slicing through the mist, aiming for the heart of the ghost before him. But as his steel met her form, it passed through, striking nothing but air. The men watched in horror as their weapons, their hope, proved futile against her. With a laugh that echoed the madness of the wind, she descended upon them, her vengeance swift and merciless. One by one they fell, not by her blade, but by their own terror. Hearts stopping in chests, too constricted by fear to beat. Takeshi, the last standing, faced Kuchisake Ona as she approached, her eyes voids of endless despair. Your weapons cannot harm me, for I am born of pain and sustained by vengeance. Your fight is not with me, but with the darkness within your own hearts, she whispered, her voice the final judgment. As dawn broke, the forest was silent the mist retreating to unveil the folly of the men's endeavor. Takeshi was discovered at the edge of the forest, his eyes wide with a terror that hinted at unspeakable horrors, marked by a sinister cut across his face, mirroring the haunting visage of the Kuchisake Ona, a chilling testament that she had claimed him as her own. The village, once a bastion of life and community, had turned into a mausoleum of its own making, the deaths of Miyako and the men had not quenched Kuchisake Ona's thirst for vengeance. If anything, they had only deepened the curse, binding her more tightly to the world of the living. In the aftermath, the villagers withdrew further, their spirits broken, their hope extinguished. Kuchisake Ona became a constant shadow, her presence a reminder of the inescapable past that haunted them. As the story of the village and its phantom tormentor spread, it served as a grim cautionary tale. Kuchisake Ona was no longer a mere ghost story, but a symbol of the devastating power of vengeance and the deep, unhealable scars left by violence and betrayal. The village, lost to time and swallowed by the mist, remains a whispered warning of the darkness that lies waiting in the hearts of men and the spirits that walk the night seeking retribution for the sins of the past. The air hung heavy with the scent of rain, damp earth, and the acrid bite of forge smoke. Toru wiped the sweat from his brow, the rhythmic clang of hammer on steel falling silent. Another sword lay finished, its freshly honed steel a cool mirror in the fire-tinged gloom. It was an offering, a peace offering to the village who had shunned his work, his presence. It was an offering to her. He'd glimpsed Yuki weeks ago, her raven hair gleaming as she knelt by the riverbank. Now, she knelt beside him, her eyes downcast. She trembled, but not from the chill. The villagers kept their distance, muttering beneath their breaths their eyes flicking from Toru to Yuki, then to the shadowed forest beyond the village. Fingers gnarled like old roots reached out. Old Mitsuba, the village elder, coughed, the sound like dry leaves beneath a boot heel. A fine sword, blacksmith, one worthy of... Her voice trailed, a hiss escaping her lips, and Yuki stiffened. Toru met the old woman's flinty gaze, Worthy of breaking the curse, Mitsuba cackled, a sound that scratched against the silence. If only, boy, if only. Night draped the hut in a suffocating blanket of darkness. Yuki lay beside him, the soft rise and fall of her breath, a fragile counterpoint to the pounding of his heart. In the flicker of firelight, he studied her face, tracing the curve of her porcelain cheek, the delicate line of her jaw, the stories flooded back. Women cursed by day, grotesque monsters by night, 
their necks slithering from their sleeping bodies to feast on blood and innocence. No, he breathed, more a plea than a denial. He couldn't tear his gaze from her neck, sleek and taut beneath the soft silk of her sleeping kimono. Her body shifted slightly, and the silken garment slipped, revealing a flicker of bare shoulder. Then, it happened. A ripple coursed across her throat, a grotesque bulge surging upwards before retreating beneath the pale flesh. Toru gasped, clawing for the flint and tinder beside the makeshift bed. Striking a spark, he held the sputtering flame aloft. Yuki lay still. Her skin was flawless, her neck unmarked. A nightmare. It had been nothing more than a nightmare. Yet the memory lingered sickeningly vivid. The fear, slithering like a serpent within him, refused to be banished. The next morning, Toru feigned normalcy. He watched Yuki prepare their meager breakfast, a sheen of nervous sweat making her movements jerky, almost desperate. She knew. She had to know he suspected. The glances she stole his way were filled with a pleading he could not decipher. Was it an apology, a threat, or something else entirely? The village stirred into its reluctant rhythm. Fear had settled here like a stubborn mold. Toru watched children snatched indoors, their mother's eyes darting nervously towards the forest. Each night, they said, another corpse, drained of blood, grotesquely mutilated. Fear had festered into something sharper now, the villagers' gazes turning accusingly towards Toru and his new wife. Outsider, one spat, a gnarled finger stabbing towards him. You brought this upon us. Your witch of a wife. His hands clenched into fists, nails biting into his palms. It was a madman's accusation, yet a sliver of doubt lingered. Yuki always indoors as night cloaked the village, always home by dawn, pale and exhausted. Enough, his own voice boomed, silencing the villagers. Yuki flinched, and something in him cracked. I'll prove her innocence. I'll end this. That night, eyes burning with a terrible resolve, he pretended to sleep. Toru lay rigid, feigning slumber as the world slowed to the gentle lull of Yuki's breathing. He waited, muscles twitching, his mind buzzing with a mixture of dread and anticipation. An hour stretched into an eternity. Another. He was beginning to doubt himself his sanity when it happened. Yuki's breathing stilled, slowly, ever so slowly her eyelids fluttered open. Her eyes gleamed with an eerie luminescence in the dim light, distinctly inhuman. Then the transformation began, her neck elongated sickeningly, a boneless grotesque column slipping from the collar of her kimono. The head atop it remained Yuki's, but her features contorted into a mask of hunger and malevolence. Her tongue flickered out snake-like, tasting the air. She slithered from the bed, her monstrous neck swaying gently. As she turned, the firelight caught her eyes one last time, and he saw the chilling truth. Yuki knew. She'd always known he watched her. His suspicions laid bare with each twitch of her sleeping form. A terrible sob rose in his throat. Damn you, witch! He roared, lunging for her. But the Rokurokubi was already at the door, head bobbing obscenely as it passed through the narrow gap. She was gone, vanished into the night. Toru followed. Driven by a maddening blend of rage, despair, and an awful desperation, he ran. His feet pounded upon the forest floor. He could hear her somewhere in the darkness, the rustle of leaves, the faint reptilian hiss of her voice. He burst through the undergrowth, heart pounding, but the clearing was empty. Yuki was gone. A primal fear, cold and sharp, clawed at his throat. How? He'd seen her, heard her. Perhaps a flicker of her monstrous form, a vanishing wisp of serpentine shadow through the trees. The journey back to the village was a tormented blur. Stumbling through the darkness, he was barely aware of the panicked voices calling his name. When he finally reached the edge of the village, a small crowd had gathered. 
Mitsuba's wizened face sharp with suspicion. Toru's voice broke as he recounted the horrific events in the forest, the monstrous form, the impossible escape. The villagers stared in a mixture of fear and disbelief, but Mitsuba's eyes held a glimmer of something else. Calculation, perhaps. The monster, she croaked. It escaped, you say. And then quietly, best be gone, though. Good riddance. And Toru knew, even as the weight of what he'd witnessed settled heavily upon him, that this was far from over. True horror lay not only in the forest, but within the hearts of the villagers. Days bled into weeks. Life in the village resumed its fearful pattern, but Toru was a hollow shell. He avoided the villagers. Mitsuba, emboldened, whispered poison. The outsider's cursed wife brought this upon us. Best she's gone, she hissed to those who would listen. Toru retreated further, his forge growing cold, his despair an oppressive weight upon his soul. Then, one moonlit night it happened. A chilling breeze rustled the trees, a sound that echoed through Toru's nightmares. He jolted awake, heart pounding with a sickening certainty. There, framed in the window, was Yuki's face. Beautiful, terrible, illuminated by the soft silvery light. Her eyes glittered with a malevolent hunger, but before he could cry out, the vision twisted and shifted, her face melting fluidly back into its human form. She was whole again, crouching just inside the entrance to his hut. Toru. Her voice was a choked sob, barely a whisper. He lunged across the small space, pulling her to him. She was real, flesh and blood, and in that moment, he didn't care about the rest. He held her, the warmth of her body a stark contrast to the chilling memory of that night in the forest. Is it true? His voice broke as he pulled back, his hands trembling on her shoulders. What you did to those people? I don't know, she wept, a picture of vulnerability. I'm scared, Toru. Help me. But I saw you. The memory of that terrible night resurfaced, his grip tightening painfully. Your face. The stories. That's when it began. Her face morphed, a horrifying, fluid transformation. Her eyes bulged, her neck elongated, becoming taut, serpentine. Before he could react, the monstrous head darted forward, wrapping around him with impossible strength. Its weight bore him to the floor, squeezing the life from his chest. In the darkness, Yuki laughed. They always fall for it. So weak, so foolish. His breath rasped, his vision fading. How many, he choked out. So many, she hissed, a sickening glee in her voice. You were the hardest, Toru, but now, here we are. He was fading, her monstrous weight crushing him. Then, a thud, and the pressure eased. His dimming vision caught the image of figures in the doorway. Mitsuba's face contorted in rage, a bloodied sword in her withered hand. Darkness swallowed him whole. Toru, in those final moments, simply glimpsed Mitsuba's wicked, knowing grin. A silent, chilling testament to the darkness of the human heart. Thank you for letting me guide you through today's chilling tale. If your heart's still pounding and you crave more, don't hesitate to like this video and subscribe for more unsettling stories straight from the darker corners of the human mind. On your screen now is another tale or playlist that promises to keep the suspense alive. Until we meet again, be careful. The darkness has eyes and it watches.